Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is Monday, the 26th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. Well, I went back to church for the first time because, uh, well, we've been under the weather a bit, so to speak, with different things, possibly COVID. I assume that's what it is. It's been going around. Uh, Lost of sense of smell, that's about it. But I didn't want to attend church until I um, waited a while. I make sure that I probably am not uh, contagious, even though for me it was very mild, other than some strange side effects, apparently. And But I, that's not necessarily the case for others. So because I love the brethren, I don't want to share with them in this case which is my position, too, in the pandemic, and people don't like that. Some people don't like that. They think you should always go to church because it's a commandment. It's a law. Yeah, like the gospel is law. Hmm, that that reminds me. I need to check something over here. You might as well watch me while I check something I forgot to check. Pray without ceasing. Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the, he said it's a command. It's not a command. Oh, yes, it is. It's a, it's imperative, but it's a, um, imperative. You you can't go simply by that. (laughs) Imperatives are used in different ways. So you have to you have to interpret. You can't just go by the gra- grammatical sense always either. You have to interpret according to the intent of the author. How do you know the intent? Well, you know the author. Uh, you, you're familiar with Paul. You, you're familiar with his doctrine. So you don't interpret a verse uh, uh, that Paul is teaching that says something Paul says here contrary to Paul's central core teaching that we're saved by grace and not through works. So, anyway, why um, why I was going to look at this is his the sermon we had a the regular pastor was I took uh, yesterday off for Thanksgiving to visit family, and uh, the replacement, which a young guy from a relative middle aged guy, I guess, from another local uh, Baptist church, filled in. Um, but not very well. <laughs> he did it, it, what? What happened was, it was not that his. Uh, well, let me start at the beginning before I get into that. I just wanted to make sure that it was actually an imperative. It's not important though. What happened? I I was very, 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 very disappointed with Sunday yesterday. Uh, first of all, the worship was, oh, it was so impoverished, so impoverished. I can understand why people go become Anglicans or Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox, uh, whatever, because Baptists are not good at worship. They're not good at it. They're bad at it. This is my now. I was not raised a Baptist. That's maybe that is part of the problem. If it was what I was used to, no, I'd still be disappointed. Uh, I first Baptist church I ever attended and ever joined was like forty-five years ago. It was a Bible Baptist fellowship, and seriously broken. <laughs> through immorality of the previous pastor. So I, when I was talk, uh, brought up Bickle, it's because I've seen the devastation uh, when uh, church leadership get involved in things. And in a, something like Bickle's thing, it would be even worse because Bickle, not Christ, is the center. A ministry that's built around a man, usually somebody that founds it, and uh, that is dangerous dangerous because satan is goes about 
looking for whom he may devour. So especially if he can destroy people's idol, uh, if they're looking to him as their mediator to Christ, well, it's probably a good thing that that idol gets destroyed in a person like uh, that's doing that. But people just start idolizing, um, and that can lead to sexual immorality too. Pastors have to be careful that they always are putting Christ first and putting themselves last. Not allowing people to become dependent on them, but helping them to grow up and depend on Christ. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Not not exalting yourself. That's that's disgusting. That is disgusting. And all these big name people is pretty much what they do. That's why they're big names. They they promote themselves rather than Christ. You should be like just just in the background someplace, uh, in the shadows. Christ should be always for in the forefront. So anyway, the the worship was the music just was bad. It's not like there's not good hymns in the hymnal. So the Baptists don't have an excuse. There's no reason they can't worship well. They just don't. It is always tinny. It's always cheap. It's always impoverished. Sometimes more than others. Sometimes they sing a song I can actually worship with. But I guess that they, they've been trying to introduce contemporary music. Why? Why? Is that, is that going to bring... That, do they have this stupid idea that that'll bring young people in? Why do people go to some of these other things, like Roman Catholicism? Not uh, too many are going there now. Because they want something deeper. They want something with history. They want something with substance. It's not the best place to find it, but they're ignorant. So, uh, well, sometimes what's called the smells and bells. Uh, there's a sense of mystery. Of course, it's deliberately. Just just like the, the charismatic worship, it is very uh, man-generated. Uh, and, tech, you know, Bickle's IHOP, if you were to strip the, the technology away, it wouldn't work very well. It requires all the modern technology to make it happen. Hmm. Does that tell you there's something wrong there? Should. Why do they need all that stuff? Why isn't the cross there? Why isn't Christ there? Because he's not the focus. That's not ministry. It's not about Christ. It's about Bickle. It's about Bickle and his visions and dreams. Uh, dreams. He's, he, he styles himself a John the Baptist. The forerunner, that's what he's currently styling his church out there, the forerunner. Well, who was the forerunner of Christ? John the Baptist. So, anyway, they had a song on the overhead. I can't even remember it. It's just about, oh, you're so good to me. Oh, you're so good to me. Something like that. It was vacuous, empty, vain. They worship me in vain. It was suitable for a um, young Sunday school class, maybe. You know, like, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's better. I would rather, I could worship that better with some reservations. <laughs> Like, for the Bible tells me so. No, if it's only the Bible, it's not good enough. <laughs> no, you have to be born again. It's not... Uh, we do not worship this book. We are not people of the book. Christians are not people of the book. We worship Christ. We are the people of Christ. We are the people of God. This book is a witness not the thing we worship. King James Onlyus and others. There's a little confusion about that. A little confusion. And people that spend an awful lot of time fighting about the Bible, why? Because is this their idol? 
we don't we don't have to have a perfect inerrant Bible. I believe this Bible is fully accurate. I don't find any particular any significant errors any place as far as what it teaches. It's the preserved teaching of Christ. But yeah, I could probably say, okay, what very you know, there's okay, what what is this word supposed to be this or is it supposed to be that? Doesn't matter, they both be the same thing, but you know, if, if you want to uh, exalt the Bible above Christ, this is a witness to him. It is not him. I should study this more carefully. I've looked at it in the past. Is this the Word of God, or is Christ the Word of God? There seems to be some confusion about that. When Paul told Timothy to preach the Word, did he mean preach the scriptures, or did he mean preach Christ crucified, that word? Think about it. Consider what Paul's teaching is, not just that verse. So when he's admonishing his disciple, his protege, his, uh, the one who was going to, had been his assistant that was now going to take his place, was he instructing Timothy to preach Leviticus and Job, and, or was he instructing him to proclaim Christ crucified? What was the message of Paul? The Bible in general or Christ, the Word? As John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word of God was God. People are going to try to twist that, but I'm trying to point out that it is not the Bible we worship, it is the one the Bible tells us about, Jesus Christ and God the Father. All right, so, hmm. You know, I'm, hmm. if I wanted to have a following on YouTube, this is not the way to do it. I know how to do it. I won't do it. I refuse. I refuse. They always try to tell me how to do things better. I'm, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, if you follow me, it's because, uh, well, it's like Jesus. He made, made it difficult for people to follow him. When you got too many people following him, they're not following him for the right reason. What did he do? He said something that offended them, and they scattered away. Yeah, they were there for the wrong reason. They wanted, for example, food. Yeah. Uh, Jesus at the food pantry. Uh -uh. uh Anyway, the sermon that the uh, the preacher decided to do was three verses, and this had numerous problems with it. So this is First Thessalonians chapter five. We said he was going to go First Thessalonians. I thought he was going to go somewhere else in here, but no. Uh, not this is. Let me back up a little bit here. This is my experience among Baptists for forty five years. So all these people that out there, when I go after charismatics, and you know, I I am I'll go after everybody uh, for things that are wrong. The shallow worship. There's no reason Baptists have to worship like that. They can do it better. It's frivolous. It's shallow. It is flesh centered. It's what pleases man, not what pleases God. And so is the charismatic worship. It's frivolous, it's shallow, it's flesh-centered. So is Roman Catholic worship. <laughs> there is something better. Corporate worship, it ought to be focused on Christ. It ought to lift us up into his presence. Charismatics try to do that. Things like Bickle try to do that but they do it using fleshly means. So does the, the formalism of the Catholic Church, the, the towering architecture and the stained glass and the, and the processions, and the, it comes right out of pagan temples and the Old Testament too. It is for fleshly people it is that, that cannot perceive the kingdom of God. 
because they're not born again. It is unsuitable for regenerate Christians. And we should not try to lower our worship to accommodate the spiritually immature either. No, it's it's, it's the problem with uh, we do things the way the world does. No, we should have a standard of worship that's suitable for mature Christians, and everybody else then can grow up into that rather than lower the entire church to the lowest common denominator, which is almost dead. Uh, yeah, that's not good. Lower to the flesh. Lower to the level of flesh that will accommodate everybody because we all have flesh. Yeah, and that's, that's what Baptist churches and evangelicals do so often. Look at what they do for vacation Bible school. Do they school people in the Bible? Or is it games and, and uh, Bible st- uh, stories and uh, weenies? And marshmallows, stuff like that. Is that what? Yeah. What's what's uh, suitable? Why don't you just tell them the gospel? Isn't that shouldn't? Is not the gospel a fascinating message? Is you know what does God offer us? the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. And we want to substitute trash for that. We want to substitute baubles and (laughs) fake stuff for what is beyond measure, beyond price. To to be the very children of God, to to know God, even in this life, we know God. And you want to give people what? Rick Warren? I mean, that, oh. And Southern Baptists, as a denomination, ate that up. It's only now because he's violated the uh, their own man-made confession that they booted his church out and they refused to let it back in now. So. Well, if you measured things spiritually, they'd have to boot out Al Mohler too. You look at his daily briefing, uh, the briefing, uh, and what is it about? The world. It's about the world. Uh, scripture says that Jesus said that Man speaks out of that which fills his heart. What a person loves is what they want to talk about. And if they want to talk about the world all the time, it's because they love the world. Uh, That's a warning sign. So the sermon, again, I I don't understand. There's plenty of good hymns in the the hymnal, hymnal. And... Why can't you do worship better? Ugh. There's no reason Baptists can't worship well. But they don't. They simply don't. It's a tradition of poor, impoverished, crappy worship. I can't think of a... I was... <laughs> uh. Anyway, the, the pastor gave a sermon, and this is really what the problem is not worship. It is, you know, it's, it's like, you know, when I was a kid in the Lutheran church that was going toward apostasy, they still worshiped better. So he used three verses uh, for his sermon. Oh, wait a minute, right here. Here we go. Pray without ceasing. No, not the, start at 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything gives thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That was his the extent of his sermon. Hmm. And he turned them, they are imperatives, but he turned them all into commands. This is what Baptists do all the time. They don't understand the gospel. They do not understand how to live as Christians. And... 
You can lay part of that at the feet of Darby and Schofield, dispensationalism. Because to the dispensationalist, the Old Testament has nothing to say about the church because the church was a mystery in their theology. So the there is no there's nothing the Old Testament says that's relevant to the church as far as the church as a as a thing. It didn't there was it was an unknown thing and God decided when Israel refused the kingdom that Jesus offered them. Well, where would the cross be then? See, this is how stupid and idiotic Darby's system is. If the Jews had accepted Jesus as king, as they claim he was offering them, then the cross wouldn't have happened, and everyone in the entire world, including all the Jews, forever and ever, would die in their sins. Hmm, seemed to be a little defect in there somewhere. What did what actually happened? Well, after Jesus fed the 5,000, they tried to take him by force and make him king, and he left. He hid himself. He would not allow them to make him king. So how can they say that Christ offered them the kingdom and they refused? No, they offered to make him king, and he refused. And yet they claim to be biblical. Ha! <laughs> And they are so blinded by the system, the people that are bought into this, they can't see simple things like that. No, the church is God's people, whether before the cross or after the cross. It's not replacement theology. It's just God's people. We haven't, been re we haven't replaced anybody. It's just that um, starting with Cornelius, it was the, the mystery— was that God intended to, to bring all the world to him through Christ. That was a mystery that was hinted at slightly in the Old Testament, but certainly wasn't revealed. Uh, the, the coming of the Messiah was revealed. Uh, the coming of the, the new covenant was revealed in the Old Testament, and that's one of the problems. Because dispensationalists will not recognize that. See, they believe the new covenant as promised in the prophets in Jeremiah chapter 31, even though it's mentioned in the New Testament explicitly, referred to, and in Ezekiel chapter 36. Those are the promises revealed in the prophets about the new covenant that would come in. It's, it's, it's referred to other places too, but those are the most extensive passages about the promises, and we'll look at those. We'll look at, well, let's do it now, uh, lest I forget. So let's go to, uh, we'll start at Jeremiah 31. And as soon as I remember how to use this program while I'm doing this, that is a little difficult. Uh, 31, roughly around verse 31, too, if I recall. Anyway, when, when I discovered this, well, I didn't discover it. The Lord prompted me. God does guide us. The Spirit of, of Christ has given us, the Holy Spirit has given us to lead us into all truth. So I am not a cessationist. Without the Holy Spirit, we're up the creek without a paddle. Now, we're, we're in a sailboat with no wind. That's actually a little bit humorous there, too. The, wind, the word wind in the Hebrew and in the Greek is the same word as spirit. That was not an even intended. It just came out that way. So if you, if you don't have the wind of the Holy Spirit in your sails, you're not going anywhere, nor can you navigate. You'll end up on the rocks. How about that for a sermon? That would be something that even little, well, no. How many people know what a sailboat is nowadays? We are so well educated now. Okay, let's go over here. This is, uh, this is quoted in Hebrews too, explicitly, verbatim, and uh, talked about in the book of Hebrews, but dispensationalists don't believe that the book of Hebrews is for Christians. 
typically. Why? Because they chose to follow, follow John Darby and C.I. Schofield rather than Christ. They didn't test the, the word, which we're told to do here. In the, uh, the other thing we were looking at. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Why is this important? Jesus at the Last Supper takes the, the, the cup of wine, which is, I'm going to assume is the, what is the fourth cup? The cup of redemption. Uh, the Passover cup. And says, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is my, bl my blood that's poured out for you. <sighs> so he's explicitly, so this is a Passover meal. Gentiles and Catholics and stuff don't seem to understand this, and Lutherans. And that the bread and the wine are part of the Passover meal, the Passover where God called his people out of Egypt and God delivered them from the final plague, the plague on the first. Oh, that's interesting, too. The plague on the firstborn. Who is the firstborn? In the New Testament, the firstborn of all creation. That doesn't mean the first creature. That means the source of all creation. Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. Just to... Another one of those biblical coincidences. But yes, the plague came upon the firstborn. Christ took the plague of death for us. I never really noticed that before. He is a substitute. So they were to take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of, the, uh, of their houses. And if they did that, if they obeyed that uh, in faith, then the angel of death would pass over that house, but if they didn't, the firstborn of the humans and the firstborn of the animals and everything else would die. Not not all, the, the firstborn of each household. That was the final plague. And Christ is the blood of the Lamb. Those who are under his blood, faith in him, the the judgment of God, the judgment of death, passes over, and the firstborn is the one who died in our place. Christ, the firstborn of Mary, too. The firstborn of God, too. The only begotten Son. <clears throat> begotten in the flesh. I don't find scriptural foundation for the eternal begetting. When it talks about the Son in the Old Testament, it's talking about the Son in a prophetic way, too. It's not talking about uh, that God eternally has a Son. No, that's I, that's come from pagan metaphysics, Aristotle. Um, bad ideas. If it's not taught in the Scripture, you don't have to believe it. So the days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Of course, this is written prior to Christ by roughly 500, 600 years. Make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Dispensationalists think typically that this only applies to the Jews. This is a bunch of horse hockey, uh, because we Gentiles are grafted in to the domesticated olive tree that the Jewish branch are natural branches of, and who is the olive tree? It is Christ. He is the root. He is the source. We are grafted in, uh, cut off from a wild olive tree and grafted in. Most people probably don't know what that is, but it's an agricultural thing. You can take a branch off one tree and splice it into a branch on another tree, and it will grow. So you can put apples on a pear tree. You can put Gentiles 
on Christ. We're no longer. See, once you're in that tree, you're of Christ, one new man. In Christ, Jews are no longer Jews. In Christ, Gentiles are no longer Gentiles. We are of him. We are the children of God. That is what the New Testament teaches. So, yeah, the dispensationalists say, well, the church is unknown. This can't be speaking of the church. It's just speaking of the Jews in the millennium or something. See, that they blind themselves. Their, their system blinds them to the, the truth of God's word. And again, this is explicitly mentioned in the New Testament. So rather than reject their silly traditions and reject Darby and Schofield, no, they, they would rather hold on to them and lose Christ which you lose an awful lot when you do this. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. The covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Um, this, Though I was a husband to him. That, that is in the, uh, the Hebrew Old Testament, but not in the Greek Old Testament. It's quoted differently in the New. That's because Jesus and the apostles quoted from a scripture source that was either the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the LXX, or it was a Hebrew text that the LXX came from. The current Hebrew is from 1000 AD, uh, and it's a text of the Pharisees, the rabbis. Uh, so which one should we actually be using? There was some controversy when Jerome started using the, went to the Hebrew as the source for the Old Testament uh, back then, like around 400-ish. And uh, the, the, to this very day, the Orthodox churches, the, uh, the Greek Orthodox, still use the LXX for their Old Testament. So occasionally you, you run into these things where you the, the quote that's in the New Testament doesn't match. So when Jesus quotes something and it doesn't match the Old Testament Hebrew, the current Hebrew we have, but it does match the Old Testament Greek translation, which should we be using? I think we should probably be using the Greek because that's the one Jesus used authoritatively. Again, it, it, may, uh, it may have been a Hebrew uh, Old Testament that was in, uh, not quite the same as the, the one that exists today. So if you find that discrepancy and wonder, how, why is that? If you were to look in, there's English, by the way, public domain English, uh, uh, because it's out of copyright. You'll find a PDF or something out there on it. A lot of Bible software have it in there free too, where you can look at the uh, at that particular manuscript of the Old Testament, that translation. It dates back a couple hundred years, roughly, before the time of Christ. It was done in uh, Egypt. Uh, who did? Who commanded that? I can't remember. Who who wanted that done? But anyway, the uh, the, the 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 New Testament quotations from the Old Testament, if they don't match, uh, are our current Bibles that are made based on the Hebrew from 1000 A.D. You think perhaps some things might have been altered by certain people, too, uh, for particular reasons? It could have been. If it doesn't match, check the Greek Old Testament. You'll find it does match, word for word. Side issue. Don't don't get your don't panic about that. It's it's not important enough to you know just for somebody that had a concern. What how come this is this is so? How come Jesus is quoting this and that's not or the apostles quote it, quote this, and I look in the Old Testament it doesn't match. That's why. That's why it doesn't match. You're looking in the wrong Old Testament. <laughs> so. My my view of authority, biblical authority, is Christ-centered. Does Christ bear witness to it? Do, do, do his apostles quote it authoritatively? And, you know, as far as canon, too, who, who quoted it? 
like Genesis, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus, the one who is resurrected, that's our authority. He is the center of authority in the Scripture. He, his use of Scripture verifies the truth of Scripture. Christ is the truth. Christ is the new covenant. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day, day, not necessarily, you know, this is a period of time, uh, that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, the covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. The new covenant uh, says, and I despise them because they broke my covenant. Uh, the, the Hebrew version says, though I was a husband to them. The Greek version and the New Testament says, therefore I despise them. Interesting change there. That, that is an example of a change that might have been altered by the rabbis that did this, that standardized the text, after Christ had come, too. There's some things that bore witness to him quite explicitly, and they somebody might have tweaked it, knowing of that. Doesn't happen very often, but once you'll run into it again, if there's a New Testament quotation from the old and it doesn't match what your old your Bible says in the Old Testament, it's because it's not the same text. They're very close; they're usually matched, but when there's a quotation, it doesn't match. That's why. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days: the new covenant, the new covenant, Christ at the Lord's Supper. This is the covenant, the new covenant in my blood. Right? Did you know that dispensationalists are blind? Because they're, they're, it's not really theology, but it's close enough that it blinds their eyes to the Word of God. That's part of the problem. Not the only problem, but it's part of the problem. And almost all Baptists are dispensationalists. This is one area where well, there's a there's new there's a new covenant theology out there too that's fairly recent because people have realized that neither uh, the Calvinist Reformed covenantal system is correct, and certainly the dispensational system is not correct either. So th there's there's been a, a, a rise in something that's called new covenant theology. I can't vouch for it. I haven't researched it, but it focuses more on the New Testament than the others, but it, it doesn't, it's sort of the best of both, which would be more biblical. So again, they think this new covenant is only for the Jewish people. And if you don't believe this is for you, you have, will have a very, very, very impoverished Christian life. This, when I, when the Holy Spirit prompted me on this by Actually, it was a question. I was just at work. And the question came into my mind. I don't know why it came in. I was just, I was just doing my job. Uh, why didn't the disciples ask Jesus what the new covenant was? I take that to be the Holy Spirit. It certainly wasn't a demon that asked me that question. It just popped into my head. And I was like, Huh, that's an interesting question. It didn't come from me. It was it was not coming out of me. It was not something I was thinking about. So it, it just sort of, whoop. <laughs> and I was thinking, that's interesting. Why well, didn't? Because they would ask him. They wouldn't understand the parables. They'd ask him to explain the parables. So here at the Last Supper, he mentions this is the new covenant, and nobody asked him what it meant. So they I think, well, they must have known what it meant. Uh, so I need to search the scriptures and see if what it says about this new covenant. And I did. And it changed my life as a Christian. It changed my life as a Christian. Radically. Before that, I was trying to live the Baptist way. After that, I learned that you live by faith in God's promises. He is sure and and solid promises. 
But this is a covenant that I will, will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, not on tablets of stone, in their minds, and write it on their hearts. It'll be in you. And because it's in your heart, you'll want to do it. And I will be, he says, my law, not Moses' law, my law. And I will, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Notice here he doesn't say you. He says they shall be. And, and I will be their God. So the house of Israel and the house of Judah, according to the New Testament, are those who believe. If you know the Old Testament, it was those who believed in Yahweh, those who trusted in, in what he said, were God's people. If you did not believe in him, you were cut off. It didn't matter whether you were the son of, uh, of Moses or the son of Joshua, or whatever. If you did not believe, you were cut off. It was by faith in the Old Testament, too. But they didn't have this. This did, was not there until Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, and then at Pentecost, the promises of the new covenant were poured out. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Promise that you will actually personally know God, from the least of them to the greatest of them. It's not something that you can be taught. It's a personal relationship. You know him. You can't be taught to know someone. You hope, the only way you can know someone is to have a relationship with them. You can't have a relationship with God unless your sins are really atoned for. There's no way God can be in you unless you've been, the temple's been cleansed by blood. Says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The atonement. Couldn't happen until Christ died on the cross. Oh, I better continue on. Thus says the Lord, who gives light for uh, gives the sun for a light by day, and the uh, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night. Who disturbs the sea and its waves roar? The Lord of Hosts is His name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall not see, uh, shall also cease from being a nation before me forever, forever. So this is not the Israel that is in the Middle East right now. This is the Israel of God, the Israel that he promises this covenant to, those who trust in him. And the, mis the only mystery of the church is the Gentiles are included also. That's the mystery. But what he says here, this, uh, this uh, where is this? Then, this uh, then Israel shall cease from being a nation before me, forever. When Jesus says, this generation shall not pass away until all these things take place, uh, the word generation really means uh, that, that which springs forth from something. It doesn't mean, you know, like springing forth from your parents. So that's we get the idea of a generation being the descent of that, but it's more than that. It is, it is uh, the generation of Abraham with all his descendants through all time. That because it comes forth from him. The generation of Christ is everyone that comes forth from Christ. So the uh, this generation was not referring to 40 years. That's a false reading. And again, we hear, see here that he's talking about the, it in the same sense. Then Israel shall cease from being before me. Christ might have been referring to this very passage. Or many others. Okay, let's go over to Ezekiel or to Ezekiel 36. It doesn't explicitly refer to the new covenant, but there's a promise in it that makes it part of the new covenant. Unmistakably. And this we go down to about verse 24. 
And of course, this is written to uh, non-spiritual people. So, Now think of the church as Israel here. The fulfillment of of it coming into place, beginning with Christ in the New Covenant. See if it makes any sense. For I will take you from among the nations. What did Jesus say in the Great Commission? Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to all nations. Make disciples of all nations. That was a mystery, but it's mentioned in the Old Testament. I will take you from all nations. Just the Jews? What about us? What about me? I was, my I, my uh, ancestry goes back to, through my grandfather to Norway, the the ends of the earth. I was saved in Minot, North Dakota, the ends of the earth. <laughs> Not even in a town in a military dorm, and the only one there besides me is the Holy Spirit came in that room. Boy, that was, called me out of the ends of the earth, the frozen north. Both ways. <laughs> I will gather you from among the nations. That's what we're doing now. That is our mission now, to take the gospel into all the world and gather his people out of all the world. Prophesied right here. New Covenant. We'll see that why that is. And bring you into your own land. What is our land? The kingdom of God. Abraham sought for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. He wasn't looking for a strip of land in the Middle East. He was looking for the kingdom of God. Christ is the kingdom of God. He is the king. If you're in him, you're in the kingdom. That's why you, Jesus said you cannot be in the kingdom of God unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, born naturally and then of the Spirit of God. The new birth, the second, first birth, and then the new birth, the, the second birth, which is of the Spirit. So what does he say here? <clears throat> I will sprinkle clean water on you. If you want to baptize by, by sprinkling, this would be a, a, a way you could do it. <laughs> It is cleansing. The, the sprinkling in the Old Testament of water was a symbol of cleansing, just like immersion is a symbol of cleansing, practiced by Jews to this very day. <clears throat> but Gentiles are pretty much ignorant of those things. So, I should do a, a video on that sometime. The, the, uh, the Jewish traditions of baptism, uh, where Christian baptism comes from, because John the Baptist was doing something the Jews understood. But then he said that I baptize you with water, but there's one coming. He will baptize you in fire. And that's referred, he's referring to the Old Testament law. You had to, things had to be cleansed either by water or by fire. Purified before they could be brought into the kingdom. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will, you shall be clean. Who does the work in both these covenants, uh, both statements of the new covenant here? Who is the one working? Us or God? It's God's promises. It's God working. Just what we see in the New Testament. It says a lot of I will, I will, I will. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. So he'll do it, and we will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. So who sanctifies us? Who cleanses us? God does. God does. It's his promise. He does the work, not you. This is a problem with the Baptists. This is, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. This is what revolutionized me. I was trying to do things the Baptist way, live by principles. Because that was a preacher was always preaching principles, 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 which is another word for law, law, law. Our works, by the works, by works shall no one be saved. It's by God's works, not our works. This is about what God promises he does in the new covenant. 
I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, the new creation that Paul talks about. This is what Jesus said when you must be, he said you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. This is the promises. And it boggles my mind that this isn't preached constantly, that I never hear it preached in so many places. I can't remember ever hearing this preached in a Baptist church. Now, maybe Reformed Baptists, they might do it. But, but dispensationalists? No! They don't have a clue. Because that system, Darby's system, has blinded them to the gospel. This is the good news. It's not our works, but his works. God's works. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Take that hard, cold thing of self-centeredness out and give you a living, warm, soft heart. Flesh in that sense, in the good sense. Instead of stone. You've heard the expression, oh, that guy's got a heart of stone. Not been born again. This is God's work. You can't give yourself a heart of flesh. You can't give yourself a heart transplant or a spirit transplant. Only God can do that. Salvation is of the Lord. That's a statement out of the Old Testament, too. I think it's out of Jeremiah. I will put my spirit. See, this, is, this proves it's a new covenant because the Holy Spirit within you. Jesus said he has been with you, but he shall be in you. Remember? If you don't think this applies to you, you are, are going to live a debilitated Christian life. You'll be a Christian quadriplegic. People will have to feed you because you can't live by faith. Faith in these promises. The just shall live by faith, not principles. The just shall live by faith. Live by faith. Typically, Baptists think of salvation as a one-time act, a transaction. God takes your name out of the lost file cabinet and puts it in the f saved file cabinet, and that's about all there is to it. Typically. the Rick Warren School of Salvation, say this prayer, congratulations, you're in the kingdom of God. That man was spiritually dead, still is. He doesn't know the gospel. They think, it, they think uh, too often people think of being born again as an experience. Well, you could say being born naturally is an experience too, but what is natural birth? Jesus compared the two, connected the two. Natural birth is what? Is it an experience? And oh, well, he was born. No, it's the beginning of a new life. The beginning of a new life. Being born again is the beginning of a new life. And the just shall live by faith. It's not a one-time thing. It's the beginning of a life of faith and trust in God. These should be ABCs. I, I want to just weep for the church because of spiritual ignorance, ignorant of God's promises because of some dead man who brought death into Christianity. Assisted to death to Bible believers. Stripped you of the promises of God. You know, the Baptists... Of, of Spurgeon's time, did not believe this garbage. 
The people that did were a small sect called the Plymouth Brethren, and only a faction of that sect. There was another faction that was like uh, Mueller, the man who built the great or orphanages and fed the orphans by faith. He didn't believe Darby. Him and Darby were at loggerheads in the Brethren. If you're going to follow somebody, follow Mueller, not Darby. George Mueller. Now, you don't, most people don't know that. Most Baptist pastors don't know it. Shame on you. I'm sure, I pretty much know where this pastor went to school, too, I can guess. You know, they blame the, 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 uh, the dying of Christianity, of evangelical and fundamental Christianity on lots of things, but they don't blame it on themselves. They just repeat what they're told. And they go to schools that repeat this stuff. They don't teach this where he went to school. I, I wanted to... I didn't have the opportunity. I wanted to just ask this guy, do you know what the new covenant is? He wouldn't. He wouldn't know. He wouldn't have preached what he preached if he knew what the new covenant is. I will put my, uh, put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes. See, God has, it's, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. We are not under the law of Moses or any other external law. Christ is our law. Him in us works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. See, when you, when you understand this, then the whole New Covenant, the whole New Testament begins to fit together instead of turning it into a book of laws. Now, it's not only the Baptists that do that. Church of Christ is nothing but legalism. They have no spirit there. There is no new birth there. They are spiritually dead, deliberately so. It was rejection of that and reduction of Christianity to five things that you do. Now, there's some churches out there that have gone more in a biblical direction. Thank God for that. But, the movement and the traditionalists in that movement, they're still utterly spiritually dead. It's about man. It's rationalism. It's about man and what man does. Five things that you must do to be saved. They, they know nothing of the Spirit of God. In fact, sometimes to, they believe that that's just another word for the Bible. I'm talking about the traditionalists. Many of them. Uh, Non-instrumental would be definitely traditionalists. Fortunately, they're a relatively small sect. But there was, they were popular for a big time because it's five things you can do, salvation that you can do without the Holy Spirit. With Rick Warrenism, say this prayer. That's all you got to do. Say this prayer and mean it. Really? That makes you saved? No. Or, or there's... Other evangelical churches, this idea of transaction, a transaction. I give Christ, they take the wallet. Do I have my, no, I don't have my wallet. What do I got here? I got a little box. So, so this box, what's in this box? It's supposed to be a filter, not the right one. So th they do this with a wallet. You'll see a preacher do this with a wallet. This is, this is something so common among uh, certain churches. Not just fundamentalist Baptist, but definitely common there. The, the wallet illustration. It's, it says, how do you be saved? Well, I, I give my sin to Christ, and he gives me his righteousness. Which is true, but what does that mean? So it's, it's so I, I, just, I just, you know, it, it, it is believing in Christ, but. It's true in that, but there's so much more there. What does God promise to do? Just take your sins? See, they reduce salvation to simply the forgiveness of sins so often. 
Yeah, you're forgiven sins in the new covenant. God takes them all away. But he gives you all these promises. So if you don't know that, you're not going to... We, we appropriate the promises of God, including forgiveness of sins, by faith in Christ. If we don't believe the promises, we don't get them. We don't see them in us. This is something, see, if you know these promises, you can wrestle with God. Wrestle with them, wrestle with them, just like Jacob did, right? So you, you can go to God and say, God, you promised. See, these are the sure and certain promises. There are yours in Christ. You can go to God, I don't see this in my life. You promised. Where is it? You can go to God in full assurance. As John said, if we ask anything according to his will, this is God's promises to everyone who is in Christ. If we ask anything according to his will, we know that we have them. God will not turn us down. But Jesus said, you have not because you asked not. Faith is necessary. The just shall live by faith, not by principles. The just shall live by faith, not trying to do things, believing God that he will do his promises, that he will do these things in us. His covenant, the Son of Jesus Christ, his blood is the blood of this covenant. There's nothing more certain than this. You have been swindled, brothers and sisters. You've been swindled. I will put my spirit within you. I, God, I will put my spirit within that you and cause you to walk in my statutes, according to his will, in other words. Not the Old Testament law. According to his will. And you will keep my judgments and do them. A promise from God. You'll, you'll walk in obedience to God. Then, I w then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. Who's, what's he talking about? What fathers? Abraham. Not, not the physical land. What was Abraham seeking? That he didn't receive until Jesus brought it in. The kingdom of God. That's his land. That's the land promised to the fathers, the kingdom of God. Not some little strip of rocky soil in the Middle East. Have you ever been there? Jerusalem, the holy city? Really? I don't think so. It's not very holy right now. It's inhabited by other spirits entirely. You won't find the spirit of, of Jesus Christ on the... Uh, uh, on the Temple Mount, you'll find a different spirit there. No, because where do you find the spirit? Where, where do you find Christ? Where he is? You don't find him, you know. You can enter into, into his presence anytime you, you desire because of the promises of God, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have to go to a place, a holy spot. There aren't no, any holy spots. <laughs> Jesus said you'll no longer worship uh, in in this mountain, or this was what mountain was that? Gerasim, or in uh, Jerusalem, for the holy the Father seeks those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's not a location. You have to be born again. You worship in spirit and in truth. Otherwise, you end up with something utterly impoverished. His spirit. His spirit, not some other spirit. And you will be my people, and I will be your God. Quoted by Peter. This actually occurs many times in the Old Testament, that statement. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Paul talks about that very thing when he calls us to come out from among them and be separate. It's all connected. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanness.
what does this say? God promises to save his people from corrupt desires like homosexual, homosexuality or gender confusion and, and greed and you know, the love of all the, idol, all the idolatry, the uncleanness in God's sight. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. What he will do in us, God sanctifies us. Man, I need to preach this at the Baptist church, but I'm not going to hold my breath. I don't think they, they could accept it. I think the congregation can accept it. I don't think the pastor would toler. you know, you'd have to convince him first. Then he can preach it. That would be even better. If the pastor over there came into the knowledge of this, he needs to lead the congregation into it. That would be the ideal, not somebody else coming in. And, no, let him, let God show this to him. Pray that God reveals this to pastors all across this land, all around this world. And then they can preach the gospel. This is the gospel. This is what Christ died for, not just the forgiveness of sins. And I will multiply the grain and uh, call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine on you. Well, in the New Testament, what's the grain? The, the seed that is sown produces what? The wheat. And the wheat be come, bears fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. But also, those God's people, He cares for us. We don't see famine, He takes care of us. If, see, we have these sure and certain promises, and we trust him as our source. Not the world, him. He may use the world, but we trust him. He is our source. How he fulfills a promise is up to him. Like, um, it's like my garden. I mean, every time I plant a garden, I end up with way, way, way more than we can eat and usually more than we can give away. Why? Am I a master gardener? No. It's just blessed by God. He blesses his children. I've, As David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their children begging, blood, uh, begging bled, uh, bread begging bread on the streets. It's true, neither have I. In all my work uh, with the homeless, I have never seen a true Christian that was homeless unless they chose to be in order to... I, I did meet one young man who was living in homeless shelters. He was going from shelter to f shelter in order to preach the gospel and to teach the scriptures. Living in their midst. That's the only one I can ever think of that was a born-again Christian. Sort of literally following Jesus' injunction to not even take a purse or an extra a garment with you. But that was a particular incident, by the way. That's not something I would recommend people to do because that's not a command to you from the Lord Jesus uh, but the, yes, he, he does take care of us. And because he takes care of us, then we can be free to serve him. Otherwise, people are, are going to be living, living their lives trying to keep themselves safe, buying all kinds of insurance and getting in debt for vehicles and, and houses. And then you have to have insurance on the houses and all this stuff, weighing themselves down with the systems and things of this world so they're no longer free to serve Christ. You know, oh, I can't do this because I've got a 30-year mortgage, so I can't go. Jesus might want me to go uh, preach the gospel up on the, the Indian Reservation in North Dakota or South Dakota, where it is. But I, I, I just know he wants me to do that, but I can't do that because I have a 30-year mortgage here. Let me tell you something. When I was pastor of a little town up here, they couldn't find a preacher. They brought in some guys. Uh, one of them turned out and started hitting on the men in the church. Uh, 
but they they told me, well, we had people that came here. One of them, uh, uh, the the parsonage wasn't suitable for his water bed, and uh, <laughs> another one said uh, uh, there was no garage for his car. But the one that ha they had been pastor there, he left because they didn't have insurance for him. So he went to some church out in in uh, uh, Wyoming that was going to, you know, provide health insurance and whatever. If those are your standards, you can't serve God. He may send you a place where you just don't have those things. You don't need those things now. If you can't trust God to take care of you, you're not living by faith. I'm not being talking about being stupid. You know, if you got a broken arm, go to the hospital and let them set it. But a lot of the stuff, just trust God. Just ask God. You start having a problem, just ask God. If he wants you to go to the hospital, he'll say, go to the doctor. They know how to set that. But if you trust in the doctors, if you trust in this world, you're trusting in the world. That's idolatry. God is our trust. Him alone. Cursed is a man who trusts in man, who makes flesh his strength, and his heart departs from the Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. He will be like the tree planted by the stream that even in drought does not lose its leaves or cease to bear fruit. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you will never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. True, but especially this is spiritual. Spiritually primary, physically secondary. He does. He does bless his people physically too. But the primary concern is spiritual. The physical is just temporary anyway. <clears throat> Then you will remember your evil ways and the deeds uh, and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourself in your own eyes for your iniquities and your abominations. Yes, we loathe ourselves for everything we've done that's wrong. Our sins, they're forgiven. But if we call them to mind, it's like, oh God, how could I have done? Yep, his promise too. That's true repentance when we remember what we did and say, oh, instead of loving it, we hate it. We have a new heart, a new spirit. We hate what we have done that is contrary to God's will. And things we've done in unbelief we, are failures because we love God. And we know we're supposed to be his image. We want him to be glorified. Those are, these are the promises of the new covenant. Without this, if you just think it's being forgiven your sins, you are going to have a defeated, defunct Christian life because you're going to try to uh, live by principles. Okay, let's go over to that. Uh, let's see, do I still have it up there? Okay, here. Let me show you. So he picked three, uh, three uh, verses here. Somehow he could only see these three verses. I think because, like the next verse says, do not quench the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he mention that? See, that this is, the, this is just three verses taken out of a larger uh, portion of text here. Of... Paul telling us things, what we should be doing. How do you do these things? Through faith in the promises of God. Not principles to obey, but but things to, to ask God for, to look for him to supply for us. He is our life. It is Christ in us. It is God in us who is will, uh, causing us to will and to do his good pleasure. 
him. We, we trust him to do what he wants to do in us. You don't have to seek his will. Just give yourself over to him. He, he knows how to guide you. You don't have to tell him how. You don't have to figure out how to know God's will. God knows how to communicate. Unless you're a Calvinist, then you don't you think he can't communicate. They they think God can't communicate to human beings in, in an intelligent way. They think he speaks with a lisp, to quote Calvin. Or I've heard that God mumbles. Theologians. It's not just Calvinists. Theologians. They are blind guides of the blind. If a blind man leads a blind man, they will both fall into a ditch. Yep. That's what will happen. So if you follow theology, if that's your focus rather than Christ, that's what will happen. You'll, you're, you're walking as a blind man. Man's theology <coughs> comes from man. <coughs> it doesn't come from God. Uh, the Scripture has sufficient information for us. You don't, anybody that adds to Scripture, that looks has, adds another authority to Scripture, like a confession of faith, for example, uh, and then they claim to be scripture, sola scriptura. It's like, really? So your confession says I should be sola scriptura, yet the confession is authoritative. Uh, you have to believe in that to uh, agree with that to be in the church. Really? This isn't Jesus' church, is it? And you're not sola scriptura either, are you? Uh, <laughs> Self-contradictory. So it's not just rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, but we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See, look at the context. So I suppose these are all principles, too. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. Why didn't he quote this stuff? I guess that was just an overdose of, of God's word or something. I don't know. Uh, but always, I'm being hard on the guy, but I haven't called him out by name or anything. So. <laughs> he's just ignorant. He's a, a he's, he's old enough that you should know better, but he's ignorant. He's ignorant because of fundamental Baptist tradition now, dispensationalism, the fact that they don't teach the gospel. They only teach part of it. And they that so you're saved by faith, and then you live by principles. That are that's fundamentalist Baptists. That is so many Baptists. That's Southern Baptists. They they're all they're they're ignorant of the new covenant. Includes most of the rest of the church too. Ignorant of the new covenant. Ignorant of the promise of God. Ignorant that that the scripture says it doesn't say we're simply saved a one time event. For, by faith, but the just shall live by faith. Who's the just? Those who've been justified through faith in Jesus Christ. Those who are born again. That you sh We live by faith. The new birth is the beginning of a life of faith. Not a single event. It's not an aorist verb. <laughs> Christians, you know, believing when it talks about uh, all those who are uh, all those who believe, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that all all the uh, all who believe, all the uh, I, I can't I can't even do it the traditional way right now. All those who are believers in him shall not perish. That's that Greek participle definite article construction that is so common. It is a continuous thing. It is a prop. It's a, a believer is. That's something that's characteristic of your life. You are a believer in Christ. It's not, I believed. It is, I am a believer. It's an ongoing thing that characterizes your life. It's like the color paint on your house. So he says, <clears throat> says that. Then he goes, rejoice always. Yes. Pray without ceasing. Oh, he did not understand this. I it doesn't mean you have to pray constantly. It means you don't stop. You don't give up. 
<laughs> you don't give up in prayer. It's part of your life. It's not a thing you do. It's just natural because you are in a relationship with God. It's not you. You don't work at it. He was making, working at your relationship with God. He said it was how to sanctify yourself, really, by works, by works, living by these principles, which is another name for law. So he turned rejoice into a law. He turned prayer into a law, and he turned uh, giving thanks into the law, into a law. In everything, give thanks, for that is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Three laws that'll make your life better. No. No, the, 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 this is not the gospel. The gospel. The gospel of God is that God does these things. He works these things in us. We don't work at it. We just recognize that this should be something that's true in us, and we ask God. God, why am I not doing these things? If you want me to do these things, you have to do it. You have to work this in me because you're my Savior. You're my life. You're my all in all. It's Christ in me who is my hope of glory, not me in me. So do, then it goes on, of course. Paul goes on, do not quench the Spirit. I don't know. I, why did he stop there? Do not despise prophecies, hmm. <laughs> but test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Then he gives us a blessing. Okay, so it's like, why don't I believe the, the, the uh, charismatic prophets are prophets? Because I test all things, and they fail the test over and over and over. They always fail the test because we don't need prophets anymore. Again, this was written uh, uh, in, the, in the time when the New Testament hadn't been all written down. We didn't have the faith delivered once for all in the saints except in the apostles themselves. Uh, so, But we have the teaching of the apostles, the teachings of Christ in written form now. So when we open the Bible, say so we open to to 1 Thessalonians, we are receiving the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Why would we need modern-day apostles that Jesus didn't choose? They chose themselves. You know, they say the, uh, the church is built on the foundation of modern-day apostles and prophets. They are usurping. They're just like the Pope saying he's a vicar of Christ. He's not. Christ does not know that man. He has the, he's an antichrist. The Pope is, is an antichrist. He's opposed to Jesus Christ in so many ways. He doesn't know Christ at all. But <clears throat> the foundation that, that the Scripture talks about in the New Testament built on the foundation of, uh, with Christ being the chief cornerstone, the cornerstone of a building is what you lay first, and everything is lined up on that mark. Everything is in reference to him. Christ, the Bible must be read Christocentrically. Christ is the center. Referenced, everything's referenced to him. So uh, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, are these New Testament prophets? Do we have any, uh, any written material in the New Testament that's composed by a prophet? Nope. Nope. We have a few examples like uh, of prophets in the New Testament, like Agabus, I believe, and uh, a few others, but we don't have any any material from them. Why? Because it was simply the same material that the apostles delivered. It wasn't written down, so God used other means to communicate it to local churches through apostles, through prophets and teachers, and you know, spiritually inspired, dire inspired directly by the Holy Spirit with the same material the same instructions. It wasn't something different. If it's different than what's in the New Testament, it, those people are to be rejected. And that's what's going on in these other movements. It is not simply them speaking forth what Christ is and the apostles have already spoken forth. We don't need it, need it. So why would the Holy Spirit be doing it? He's given us his words in the Scriptures. That's sufficient. 
That's why apostles and prophets don't exist today. We have the apostles still with us in this in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, we have the prophets that spoke of, like the New, New Covenant, that spoke of the coming of Christ. And when in the New Testament, like Matthew, and all the, through the epistles, all through the Gospels, when it speaks of the prophets, it's referencing back to the old, connecting the new with the old. It was spoken of the prophets, promises in the old, the fulfillment in the new. So the Old Testament prophets that spoke of the new, that spoke of the new covenant, that spoke of the church, that spoke of Christ and the kingdom of God, they are part of the foundation of the church too, all reference to Christ. Say amen, because I will. I can recognize when I'm teaching the right thing, too, by the way. Uh, so then Paul even goes on beyond that to a blessing. Verse 23 here, which this is the end of the epistle, the first epistle of Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So what he was just talking about, things are part of our sanctification. And now he says, God will sanctify you because it's a new covenant. See, this pastor didn't understand it. I, well, I don't even know if he's actually a pastor. He might just be an assistant or something. Um, he wasn't referred to as as pastor or something. Uh, he originally came from the church, too, I guess. But he's, he's serving in some capacity at another church. Nevertheless, he doesn't know what he's doing. He shouldn't be preaching what he was preaching. But this, the, the, I'm sure the regular pastor would do the same thing. Uh, Baptists preach principles. They don't preach the gospel as a way of living. They preach the gospel as a way of salvation, but they don't understand that birth is just the first step in a new life. It's like, really? So you were you stillborn or what? It's, so they... You know, when a person celebrates their birthday, it's not like really because they want to get back and experience it again. It's like, who remembers their birth anyway? Oh, we remember, you know, when, when Christ saved us, usually people remember that. They don't have to necessarily. It's whether or not you are in faith. You have faith in Christ. Uh, sometimes it's dramatic and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very clear. Sometimes it's not. But the question is, what do you, What's your relationship with Christ now? It's not uh, that you remember of an event. Although I remember mine, if I focus on it, it'll still bring tears to my eyes because of what he saved me out of. Wow, amazing. Amazing. And we should be grateful. I mean, we when we, as, as uh, in... Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36 there, when he says that you will despise all the things you've done. Uh, looking back, yeah, we, we gratitude for, see, that should be invoking gratitude, not guilt, but gratitude. We're under his blood. It's all forgiven. But that should be provoking praise and, or invoking praise and uh, evoking praise and gratitude toward him for what he's delivered us from. And his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace. It's it's not to condemn us, it's to to turn our eyes toward him anew. Understand? May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. This is what the holiness stuff uses here. They use this verse. They don't understand what they're saying. <laughs> And may your whole spirit, soul, and body, they just leave, they just snip it. They snip that out of it and use that alone. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body, tripartite. Some people say, oh, we're just soul and body. No, spirit, soul, and body. Uh, three components here. Be preserved, blameless. See, this is why the, uh, you know, when I looked at this verse too with the, the holiness, the Nazarenes in mind. See, they, they believe sanctify you completely today. Now, that you can be sanctified entirely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at, at, 
at. They, they, they only take that first part because the rest of it contradicts what they're asserting. That you can be sinless today. What's it? Spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. Why? Blameless. Why? Because you're under the blood of Christ. you got to remain under the blood of Christ. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Again, it goes back to what God does, what Christ does, not what we do. That's the, the, the teaching of the Apostle Paul and the New Testament and the Old Testament. The law of Moses, there's no promises in it. It's just curses. Yeah, if you keep the law perfectly all the time, you'll get the blessings of God. You'll be the head and not the tail. There are those that misuse that, too. Who's the head and not the tail? Christ. He is the only one who ever has kept the law. He received all the blessings of the law. He is our righteousness. We are in him. We keep the law in him because he kept it. Okay, so why can't they see the truth? So obviously the school this guy went to didn't teach them this, him this. The pastor, I know the school he went to too. I know the school. I visited her one time. They didn't teach them him this. If if they understood the new covenant, these promises that would change their preaching dramatically, it would change the church dramatically. They would start living by faith, not by principles. Stop preaching principles. Preach the grace of God, the promises of God that are that we walk in by faith. We walk in the Spirit by faith, trusting that God is at work us work in us to do will and to do his good pleasure. It's his. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has prepared. Can I get an amen? You know, I was thinking the other day that, you know, that when I was I was doing my thought experiment, and if God were to send me to some backwoods Lutheran church, which is which would really be crazy because, you know, I'm a man with no letters and not no longer Lutheran, and I don't believe the the uh, I I don't accept the authority of the formula of Concord and and all anything like that. Like it, it could be true. There's good things in it. It's not all wrong, but it's like it doesn't have the authority of the Word of God. It doesn't have the authority of Scripture. It doesn't have the authority. Jesus Christ didn't deliver that to us. I can't find it in the New Testament. It's not part of the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. Nor are these prophetic utterances by all these so-called self-proclaimed prophets out there and apostles. It's not what they proclaim is not in the New Testament. If it was, then they would be God's prophets. They'd be speaking forth God's word. They're not. Yeah, the pastor that actually is preaching the scriptures is more of a prophet than they will ever be. And if he's doing it accurately, he's not a false prophet. If he's twisting it, he is a false prophet. If he's t mutilating God's word. So, uh, yeah, I was thinking that that you know, it's some you know because I've been a pastor in small churches. I sometimes like oh you know I was thinking I I could have done it better, but I didn't have a I didn't have a living congregation. Uh, there's some people in it because of their tradition too. They didn't have the same problem. They didn't have an understanding of the new earth birth, and I I did preach this there. Pretty much all the time. Uh, and you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, sometimes I would like to do that again. Or at that moment when I was in the midst of that thought experiment, you know, if I were found myself in that hypothetical situation, what would I do? How would I do things differently? After you know, many years later now, and that was what that uh, that video was on, and I was I was thinking about that, but then I, then I was thinking, you know, I get to talk to a whole lot more people on the internet here, on YouTube or whatever, than I would ever get to talk to as a pastor in a church. 
even videos that were done quite a while ago, sometimes I'll get a comment on them or something because <laughs> it's, it's persistent. Um, now, of course, now churches are putting a lot of their, most churches are putting their stuff online, I think, because of COVID that pushed things in that direction. God has uh, his ways. If we won't do it on our own, he'll force us to do it. And I thank God that there is gospel going out through that, but the, some of the gospel is going out. It's like it's like the church I've been attending. I mean, I mean the, the worship is like, maybe I should go on Wednesday nights to the Lutheran church that wouldn't allow me to take communion there because they're too sectarian. But their worship is so much better. And I mean, uh, there's churches that are better than that. But, but I mean, the the Lutherans are right on the gospel. That's not the problem. They just Luther just retained too much of Romanism, but the gospel is the issue. That's the important thing. But the they don't use the screen and they don't have contemporary. Now some do, some do. The the uh, Association of Free Lutheran Churches or the something like that A F L C. There's a church. Well, it's too far from here, really. It's like 30 miles away. Uh, there must have been something out there. They were probably ELCA and, and decided, no, we're not going to stay here, which would have been good. But they're really, uh, my parents, the last church they went to, they went to a Lutheran Church, Missouri, Center, and they weren't really comfortable there. So they started going to this other smaller church. It was an AF, AFLC. And I remember going there and said, well, this isn't, too different than a Baptist. <laughs> I think the pastor dressed uh, as a normal man. He, he wasn't dressed in, in dresses, uh, clerical garb that looked like a Catholic. Uh, and it was quite evangelical. It, I mean, it was more of a of that style. Uh, so this, it's not that all Lutherans are a particular style. And it was like it's something other than some of the, some of their, and they took they had communion more seriously. That's one of the things I I really don't like about the Baptists. They don't take communion very serious. And I, of course, I don't hold to the the transubstantiation nonsense. It's not about the bread and the wine itself. It's about Christ. See, that's that's where they get that wrong. The, the Catholics get that wrong, and Luther held very strongly to. Not exactly the Catholic view, but but the is that this is my body. He is 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 literally on the table. Is 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 in a debate with somebody else. The the, the Protestants split over that. Who was he debating with? I don't know. Was it? Uh, doesn't matter. But he was thoroughly Catholic in that. But there, there's no need for that. There's no need for a metaphysical explanation. It, it's just metaphysics, which is garbage. Just Aristotle, garbage. That it's talking about substances and uh, appearances, and it, it's it's not reality. It's not reality. That they, they were ignorant. You know, we look at things today. We know a lot, whole lot more about reality in some ways. But the argument was based on Aristotle's craziness. He, he had no idea about anything, really. Uh, and the, the, the bread being transformed literally into the body, blood, soul, and divinity. I don't think they went to the soul and divinity of the Lutherans. But th that's not the issue. It's not physically eating Christ. We eat Christ by faith. <laughs> it's... Yeah, so what? What the when you buy into that? So like I was thinking this this uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Center that's that's down the road a ways here. I mean, I like the worship. I, I'm not used to their liturgy, but it is a it is better worship, and the sermons are often very good. And the the pastor is very Christ centered. He keeps it on the gospel. He keeps keeps on Christ crucified, and. Uh, but you know, it's not the, the the. It looks like a Catholic church, but you know that's that's something that's not 
important. It's the gospel is essential. But the problem is, is they are the else the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate is so sectarian. So, you know, in the sense that if you don't hold completely agree with the formula of Concord, which is the this section, oh, this section here. How many have actually read that? You can't take communion with it. Did Jesus say that? Did Jesus hand out the formula of Concord to his apostles and disciples and say, if you all agree with everything written in this, you know, that this is a, the, the faith delivered once for all unto the saints, right? Uh, here. Why isn't it in my New Testament then? Why isn't it in the common New Testament of the church, including the Catholic church? Why isn't that there? So if, if you know, other churches do this too, and I have a real issue with this. This is denominationalism. It's separating yourself from God's people. And as I was thinking about this church there, I was thinking because of the style, because that a person walking into it probably would think that this is the Catholic Church, I was thinking, considering the disaster called Pope Francis that's happening in Rome now, and he's just utterly destroying everything, including the Mass, that conservative Catholics might find a home in the Lutheran Church of Missouri Senate because it wouldn't be a culture shock other than not seeing Mary there. Uh, on a, an image of Mary. But the, the crucifix, yeah, that was a shock to me. I didn't think Lutherans, any Lutherans did that, but apparently they do. I did know Luther was not uh, keen on getting rid of all the, that stuff, but he, uh, you know, was, the Mariolatry was, was, was not retained. Uh, but in, uh, which has grown since that time, by the way. But uh, that would be a, a place of refuge for for Catholics that it got to the point that this is wrong and they don't just don't know what to do. What do they do? Just hope Francis dies, but he has set it up so his successor is going to be as bad or worse than him. They have, you know, the, the, you may not know this, but uh, just uh, a short time ago, uh, he basically put out a teaching. Now, what Catholics don't understand either. You know, there's lots of excuses about papal infallibility and how it only applies in are these circumstances and are that circumstances. They're wrong. They're wrong. They're they're not. They're trying to get out from underneath the mess from Vatican I, uh, which was in the 1800s, that declared the infallibility of the Pope as a dogma, in other words, de fide, if you don't believe it, you're going to hell. That's what de fide is. Just like in the 1950-ish, 50s, I think the the last de fide uh, doctrine was the uh, bodily assumption of Mary, that she was, her body was brought up in, uh, uncorrupted into heaven. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of, Catholic teaching out there that makes her a co a co redeemer and a co mediator with Christ. Catholics typically look to Mary more than Jesus. Mary's usually front and center in a Catholic church, traditional one. Behind the altar you'll find Mary, not Christ. And then Christ is usually off to the side, and a little crucif a crucifix over to the side. Uh, and there'll be a few candles there, but most of the candles will be burning in front of Mary. I mean, I've seen enough of this. And, and major basilicas, uh, the Basilica de San Juan in San Juan, uh, uh, Texas, that's, there's a, that's a shrine to our Virgin of San Juan, I believe. Yeah, uh, they have a, like a, adult style doll up there and people are worshiping it literally worshiping looking to Mary to meet their needs not Christ not Christ to Mary 
That's what it's built around. They went down to Mexico and brought up this idol and built a basilica around that idol. Supposedly she did a miracle. They were bringing it back from Mexico, and if you've driven to Mexico, you know the roads are a little narrow. <laughs> they are not like American interstates. Uh, and anyway, they had a car crash and went down into the ditch someplace, but nobody was killed. So that's a miracle for Mary, that nobody died while trans transporting her idol. <clears throat> I I would say, uh, yeah, that's uh, sort of in isogetically as ascribing a miracle. Well, there wasn't one. The miracle was that God did not strike them with a lightning bolt and destroy everything in his grace. But, yeah, that's... But the, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, because of its similarity to its uh, Lutheran uh, to Roman Catholicism, has an opportunity to evangelize Catholics and provide a place of refuge for them. However, a, even though their doctrine of the of of the Lord's Supper is very similar, I don't think a, a Missouri Synod pastor would serve it to. Catholics. Shame on you. Shame on you. If they're coming to you to receive Christ, don't turn them away. They are the obvious missionaries of the Lord to the Roman Catholics. The only Protestants that could, you know, say, come here, you won't find much different. But they do, you know, they're biblically sound and they focus on Christ as far as holding to the authority of Scripture. How do you withhold the authority of Scripture and require people to believe the formula of Concord? Yeah, same thing with any confessional church. How do you make the confession the authority and still claim that you're solo scriptura, that the scripture is the authority? No, it's not consistent. Anyway, that's, uh, I guess, what I want to say this morning. It's only an hour and 47 minutes. i got plenty of time left. But, yeah, this is, this is the, the loss of the understanding of the new covenant. The, the, it's so full of the, the new covenant in the, in the epistles and everything else in the New Testament that the failure for people to understand the connection and see the clear and succinct promises of the new covenant given in Jeremiah and Ezekiel of what God does. And if Baptist pastors and other pastors who have been preaching principles rather than God's grace in the new covenant, rather than Christ, would just look at this and understand it it will change your ministry. It will change your life. It will change your church. You'll find Christ in your midst much more. Preaching principles pre is preaching death. It only brings the knowledge of sin, the knowledge it brings people under the condemnation of principles rather than under the blessing of God's promises. They will just be constantly struggling and despairing because you're not ministering Christ to them, you're ministering law to them. Even so far as turning what is supposed to be grace into law, into principles. Don't do that. We live by faith. The just shall live by faith, not by principles. <laughs>